Uh, one of the most common pieces of advice that I get when about giving talks like this is that I should know my audience. So I decided I'm going to get to know you guys the best way I know how, and that's through data. If you can recall, when you applied to attend this conference, you answered a series of questions about your lives, the youth, your, uh, your learnings, and your goals. And we can use something called sentiment analysis to turn your responses into numbers that we can measure and play around with. I'll take you through how it works. It simply tags certain words, such as the word love, with a polarity, and that's defined as positive or negative. And then sentiment analysis crunches together all these polarities in the words to form a score. In this case, the sentence, I love you, is given a score of 0.57, positive. When you add an amplifier, such as very much, the score is intensified. Conversely, if you add a negator, such as don't, the score flips around to the negative side. And of course, downright saying the opposite, I hate you, will merit a negative score. So we did this to all of your responses and looked at your positive words, negative words, and the topics you've talked about, and this is the result. Turns out we're a pretty positive bunch. We're positive about everything, especially ourselves our lives and our goals. Not so much on our fellow youth, and not so much on learning, but that's okay. <laughs> but what I thought that broad averages tend to conceal a lot of information. So maybe there are segments in this audience that might be interesting to look at. So I used a technique that arranges the audience members based on how similar your responses were and groups you together. And this is the result. The colors are groups, and the people are dots. Those guys, those dots are you. So I found that there are four groups in this audience. The first in yellow are the optimists, those that are pretty positive across the board, especially about themselves. The second group are those that are laid back. They're positive about everything, but the learnings that they've had in life were quite negative. negative. The third group are the restless. They're very positive, especially about their goals, but tend to look at the youth as somewhat negatively. Uh, and the last is an outlier, um, so different from the rest of the audience that we had to categorize him or her in a separate group. And he, that person is the doomsayer. <laughs> this is basically neutral on all four fronts and then extremely negative on the youth. Hopefully, after this talk, we won't need that category anymore. So with that, I'd like to say it's nice to meet you all. My name is Troy, and as you all know, uh, as you all probably all know already, I like to use data. I, I like to use numbers to figure out what's happening in the world. And I'd like to talk to you about something that I think is lacking in the way Filipinos run their organizations and businesses. And that's the data mindset, or what Hans Rosling might call, let the data set change your mindset. Before we get into the details, I'd just like to define for you what data is. And data is simply a collection of stories. But what makes data special is that they're standardized and measured in a way that allows us to see the entire picture without having to look at each individual story. So let me give you an example. This is a graph of presidential priorities. I took all of the state, state of the nation addresses of each president from 1987 and then graphed how many words each president spent talking about a particular national issue. So one thing that you'll see is that the economy always takes up a large share, but then the environment in dark green always takes the sidelines. You might also notice when President Estrada talked increasingly about law and order, just before he was removed from office. You might also notice when President Arroyo was increasingly mum during the first two years of her re-election. And also, President Aquino's emphasis on graft, corruption, and justice. So each sauna is an individual story. But because we've standardized and measured them in a way that we can see the entire picture, we can extract new insights. 
And that's the power of data. So there are three tenets, so to speak, of the data mindset that I'd like to emphasize to you. And the first one is that we should recognize the limits of intuition and personal experience. Frequently, you'll see this in organizations and the way they are run. The leader relies on some anecdotal information or their gut feel to make decisions that may have sweeping effects on the organizations or the communities that they handle. The data mindset recognizes that unless you take a step back and dig down into the details, there might be things that your intuition and your gut feel might miss. So for example, let's take a look at election data, provincial election data for the 2004 presidential elections. On the horizontal axis, you have voter turnout. And on the vertical axis, you have the share of the winning candidate. The, each circle is a province. The size is the size of the voting population, and the color is the region in which the province belongs. So if you take a look at the data, you'll see three points there that are not like the others. These three points all belong to the same region. The winning candidate had a really high share in all three, and for two of them, the voters turned out, turned out to be greater than 100%. How can that be? Well, it turns out that these three regions all belong to the ARMM. And up to now, the 2004 elections in this region is still being contested. Let's take a look at another example. I'll use Benford's Law. If you think about how the first digits of some numbers are distributed, like, for example, how much you spend on food every day, you'd think that any digit from 1 to 9 is equally likely to appear as the first digit, right? But it turns out because of the way numbers grow, the actual distribution of numbers is like this. Ones are the most common first digit, and nines are the least common. So if you, even if you apply this to any data set, regardless of the origin or the type of the data set, Benford's law tends to hold true. But what happens when you apply it to data that is unnatural? And that, by that, I mean customs data for January 2014. Let's take a look at different import products. Books, OK, all regular. We don't seem to have a problem here. When we take a look at cotton and fabrics in terms of the duties and taxes paid, eight seems to be their favorite number. It might be Chinese. <laughs> but then when, you and then when you take a look at meat and meat offal, Twos and threes tend to be their favorite first digit for the dutiable value. And while this is not prima facie evidence of fraud, a brief look at some news articles suggests that these import categories may be high risk. So the second tenet of the data mindset that I talk about is to know that the conclusions you reach might not be those that you set out to obtain. So for example, I hate buses along ads, so they're crazy. They're maniacs. But then when you realize that 88% of the commuting public squeezes into 50% of the road space along EDSA, you find it easier to forgive a bus when it cuts you off. Also, you might be familiar with this ad in the newspaper that attests that the Philippines has the highest tax rates in Southeast Asia. At first, I was very skeptical until I took a look at the tax rates for all ASEAN countries for each taxable income level adjusted for the cost of living. As you can see, the red line over there, except for very high income levels, the Philippines taxes its people the highest. But then that bred a new question. Why is our tax collection effort so low despite the sky-high tax rates? Well, this. 516 billion lost to tax evasion every year. Compare that to the budgets for education, and health. Compare that to the cost of the pork barrel scam and estimated corruption losses. Compare that to the cost of major infrastructure projects. You can see that tax evasion in the Philippines is clearly non-trivial. The third aspect of the data mindset, and what I think is most important, is that we need to listen inclusively. I've talked about how data can allow you to see the entire picture. Data can also help us listen to each other, not just the select few, not just those you're close to, not just your friends, but to everyone whose stories 
have been recorded, measured, and standardized. For example, if we listen to the beneficiaries of the government's flagship anti-poverty program, we can see that the number of beneficiaries doesn't seem to match that of the level of poverty in each region, suggesting that more beneficiaries might need to be targeted in far-flung poverty-ridden areas. If we listen to the individual stories of riding and tandem shootings around the country from 2011 to 2013, we can see that it's not just a Metro Manila or Mindanao occurrence, but rather it's a, a, a terrifyingly regular and nationwide phenomenon. And for a more recent event, if we take a look at the individual stories of Twitter users during Pope Francis' visit to the Philippines, we can see that some people reacted positively and some negatively. We'll take you through the positive, some positive responses. This guy thanked the Pope, even though he was, she, he was just watching on TV. This guy quoted the Pope, and this one wished him well as he left for Rome. We'll take a look at some of the negative responses. This girl was just defending her faith. This girl was right smack in the middle and was complaining about the lack of cellular service. And this one was just criticizing the fanfare around the Pope. So data analysis isn't new, but what's new is that the tools, the data, the information has only become available to us today. So everyone can be a technocrat now. Everyone can get their own data ask their own questions, get their own answers, and share it with everyone. T the title of my talk was how the hero generation is an informed one, and, it, and that's going to be my concluding note. First, we just need to discard uh, the notions that we have that our country is hopeless. So the simplest definition of a poor family that's been given to me was that a poor family has too many children and too little money. So that's why on the horizontal axis, you'll see the number of children per woman, and on the vertical axis, you'll see the percent of our people living in poverty. The Philippines is the red dot in the center, and this is 1985, just before the People Power Revolution. We are at five children per woman and 60% of people in poverty. So watch what happens as we progress in time. both variables start falling. There's a brief setback during the Asian financial crisis, but then it rebounds. Until in 2009, we are at three children per woman and only 40% living in poverty. If that's not an improvement, then you tell me what is. So we need to discard notions of hopelessness about our country that only belong to the martial law era. Second, the Philippines is on the verge of a demographic transition. And what I mean by that is the demographic window, a time in a country's life when the working age population is much larger than the dependents, the seniors, and the children. And as you can see in this case, for China's example, as the working age moves up, I mean the, the mass of the population moves up to the working age, that's the time of sustained economic development for China. And I'd like to show you then what the Philippines looks like since 1960. It, may, it might look hopeless, but did you see that at the end? Did you see the population start moving up? That is the, our entry to the demographic window, and it's expected sometime this year or next year. That is our opportunity. That is our generation. And if we learn to stay informed, if we learn to listen to each other, and if we learn to share with each other what we learn, there's no doubt that this generation could be the hero generation. Thank you.